Well, we're glad to be back with you. And um, I was thinking about this past week and and the White Fragility Study Group in particular, we had, I don't know, almost 40 people, 30-something people. And um, Annie Love Villiers was one of the people, and she gave me permission to share what she shared when we were in a breakout group, because I was really moved by what she shared. And I thought, you know, while we all have different personal circumstances, we may relate to the overall feeling that she was conveying. And essentially, she said, I don't want to be here. <laughs> That was her first words. I don't want to be here. She said, I, the last three years have been really, really hard. I lost my sister after caregiving her. I lost my husband after caregiving him. You know, here we are now in a pandemic and with a quarantine, and then there's all the politics to deal with. And she said, I'm tired of learning, and I'm tired of being responsible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we just want to be in a place of comfort and we continue to be afflicted in our comfort, right? She talked about how she stayed up all night the night of uh, the event in Minneapolis where uh, George Floyd died at the knee of a police officer. Of course, we all know about that. And she said the anger that she witnessed was palpable. She said that she really felt the, the raw anger and the frustration. And she said, for the first time, I really got it. I really understood or began to understand that there was no other way left to express, that it was really clear that I don't know what I don't know. And so she said, I don't want to be here, but I have to. And maybe you feel that way too. <laughs> maybe you feel guided in some way by spirit to get more educated, to maybe join some social activist movements, and there's a part of you that goes, I don't want to. <laughs> there's a push up against that. There's a reluctance to get outside of our comfort zone. So it might be because we're afraid maybe we'll learn something about ourselves that we'd rather not know, <laughs> or we'll learn something about society and our world that we'd rather not know, that we kind of like the comfort of the world that we know. And often that's when we are on that precipice of change, right? When we're clinging a bit to what was, to what the way we thought things were, to our old perceptions, our comfortable perceptions, and we realize, the truth is, is, is emerging, you know, the lid is blown off that which is no longer uh, true of this world that we thought we lived in, of the kind of peace and kindness and love and, and joy that we envision isn't necessarily the reality or we're further, it seems we're further from that reality, but the truth be told, we're in the midst of that major transformation to that reality. So it is a rich time for us to engage, and it is understandable that we would also have a little bit of pushback. It's intense. These are intense times, and there are intense things being revealed. And so here we are on this walk. A lot, you know, I think all of us signed up for this, right? Here we are in Earth School at this time as, as a soul group in unity and, and many soul groups that you're probably a part of and as individuals and as a soul group as a country, really, as, you know, redefining, re-understanding what does it mean to be American and, and what are those ideals that were set out for us um, that, that we really can, we know as truth students, as new thought students, that, that we can realize those. We affirm that, we know that truth, but it sometimes seems like a long time, a long way, a very long walk from where we sit now to that realization. But that's what we're about, right? Picking up our faith, taking hope, helping each other, knowing that, yes, we can keep moving through. So to Annie's credit, she's still there. She showed up and she came even though she didn't want to be there. It made me think of this whole idea of resisting and, and being reluctant made me think of the very resistant prophet Jonah. You might know Jonah's story. Most of us know Jonah's story because of his time in the belly of the whale. But there's a lot of backstory that happens before he got there. Jonah was guided to, by God to go and speak to the Ninevites. To, um, to Nin the place was called Nineveh. And so he was guided to go to Nineveh. And Jonah didn't want to go. And so he did what we would all do, right? Try to avoid God's presence. And he literally got on a boat 
to Tarshish, a town that was in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh, in order to escape the, the call, but also, literally, he wanted to escape God's presence, which is sort of funny, but in a way, it's something that we do too, that we try to push away or zone out or, or not listen to that guidance. The last time I'm going to pray or meditate because I don't want to be asked to do what it is that I don't want to do. And so there was Jonah digging in. The funny thing is that you know, we can't ever be separated from, you know, we, we think this idea, this idea of the will of God is something that's separated from us, but we know we can never be separated, right? We can never be separated from spirit. We cannot escape the presence. It's here, it's in us, it's all around us, we're made of it. So it's just a matter of whether we want to listen to it and, and drop into it and participate with it, or we want to push against it. Most of us have been on the journey long enough to know how it turns out when we push against. But still, it seems we try. And certainly that was the case for Jonah. A lot of entrenchment in, in, in um, not going there. So this idea of God's will being something separate, it, it's not so. You know, the very heart of us, our, our deepest heart's desire is always one with the will of God. So we may think on a relative level that we want to do something else like Jonah did, but when we get deep into what we've been called to do, who we are, our oneness with spirit, it, it becomes clear that there is no separation between that will. It's not imposed upon us by some, you know, sort of Lord of the sky. It's a part, it's a, it's a nudge from within us that's asking us to go deeper, to go further, to expand ourselves, to step in, to say yes. But there's a lot of no before we get to yes sometimes. And that's where Jonah's story helps us see that we can, sometimes we do this and hear some of the consequences that happen. So Jonah was resisting. And let's know a little bit about why he was resisting. He was resisting because he didn't like the Ninevites. And he didn't like the Ninevites because he perceived that they had done something wrong to the Hebrews, which were her, his people. And he also didn't like the Ninevites because he perceived them as being inferior to the Hebrews. So he didn't want to help people that he thought were inferior. They were other. They weren't worth saving, essentially. And he also, you know, so I guess in short, Jonah was a bigot, right? <laughs> he was bumping up against his own bigotry, I should say, rather than labeling him. Because we all are bumping up, probably, as we do this work into some of our own prejudices, some of our own biases and bigotries. And so this is part of our journey. He uh, judged them. He resisted going and delivering a message that God wanted him to, to deliver that could be healing and liberating for these people. So what happened when he was at sea, when he was on that boat in the opposite direction, was a great storm came upon the boat, and everybody on the boat was, you know, slipping around the deck and freaking out, and they threw the cargo over, hoping that would lighten the load and the storm would stop. And meanwhile, Jonah is down below in the lower deck sleeping. So what is that about? You know, he's, sometimes it's what we do, right? We zone out or we numb out. If, if, our, if our push against, if our trying to move the other direction didn't work, then we just sort of find another way to sort of, you know, numb our feelings or pretend or fall asleep, <laughs> quite literally or figuratively. So in this case, Jonah falls asleep and the captain of the ship, of course, metaphorically, is the highest part of us, right? Comes down and he wakes Jonah up. And he says, Jonah, Jonah, why are you sleeping? Wake up and call upon your God. There's a major storm going on. So he comes up on deck and the other sailors are saying, have you angered your God in some way? Because everybody's praying to their own gods and, and, it, and the storm isn't stopping. You know? And Jonah says, hmm, yeah, I got to admit it. I think I'm the reason why the storm is happening. I think it's because I'm running from God. I'm hiding, I'm trying to hide, I'm pushing away and against what I'm being guided to do. And so they said, well, what should we do? And he said, well, I think if you threw me overboard, it might work. Well, they, they were kind men and they didn't want to throw him overboard initially, but the storm just raged on. And so finally they did. And of course, the storm, the sea got very calm, the storm subsided. 
But Jonah's troubles weren't over because he was still dug in. He still didn't want to go to Nineveh. But now he's in a pretty slippery place, right? <laughs> he's in the middle of the ocean floating around and in comes a huge fish, it says in the Bible, we often interpret as the whale. The whale comes and swallows Jonah whole. And so he then is swallowed in the belly of the whale. And he does what all of us would do in the dark for three days. He's now forced into contemplation. He's forced to think about this whole situation. He's forced to, well, he's not forced, but he decides then to do some prayer and meditation. You know how we often say it has come to that? We resist even our prayer and meditation until there's catastrophe, and then everybody says, oh, all hands on deck, so to speak. Let's start to pray. Well, that's what Jonah's experience was. For three days in the belly of the whale, he simply meditated in the dark. And eventually he was then, at the end of those three days, spewed out by the whale upon the dry land. And so there he was. Now, what's he going to do? Well, he better head to Nineveh, right? So he goes to Nineveh and he preaches to the people, but his heart is completely not in it. He's just going through the motions. If I just do this, you know, and get it over with. So he goes and he preaches and then he goes outside of town a distance because he's hoping that the whole town and all the people and animals will be destroyed. That's how hateful he still is. So he's just sitting there waiting to watch the explosion of whatever it will be, fire or destruction that will happen, that will come upon them. But they, the people heard the message anyway, even though his heart wasn't in it. The king heard it, and the king put out a decree to all the people and the animals to begin to pray and to fast. I love that it's, it includes the animals praying and fasting along with the people. And so they do. They pray and they fast and they, they decide that they're going to change some of their ways. And of course, God saves them, much to Jonah's chagrin, right? So he's really like, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe that God saved these people that aren't worthy of being saved. So God, out of his infinite compassion or her infinite compassion, grows this tree up above Jonah so he can have some shade where he sits. But Jonah's so ungrateful that that tree then withers by the next day and he sits in the wind and the hot sun and he feels really faint and he says, just take me out, God, I want to die. And so God points out that maybe he should have a little more compassion for 120,000 people and animals, but Jonah just doesn't seem to get it and that's where the story ends. That's not where our story ends. That's just where Jonah's story ends. And so we pick it up and we take it from there. From the times that we have said no and we have pushed against or we have tried to run from and then dug in further, we learn and realize that it never works that way. And so we got to find a way to get right in our hearts with what it is that is ours to do, that what it is that we are being nudged to do and to just say yes. We don't have to have all the answers, we won't. But all we need to do is say yes, to be willing to take a step in, to say I'm showing up like Annie did. So what can we do when we're feeling this way, when we maybe feel a little stuck? We might feel pulled by a vision, yet there's a part of us that's pushing against it, and so we're in that push-pull. Well, what we can do is call for help, right? It, the scripture says, ask and it will be given you. So we ask for help. We call in help. And that can look a lot of different ways. We may be calling upon that first principle of unity, that the source, the allness of God, something that it feels greater and more powerful than us, even though we know that we are one with the divinity within us. We might call upon a particular aspect of the divine. Perhaps we'll call upon an aspect that we think will most serve us in, in this moment. This is one of the brilliance, uh, I think part of the brilliance of the Hindu religion and often misunderstood that all these gods and goddesses in the Hindu religion are different aspects and faces of the one essence of God, the, the divinity. And, and they can be called upon and invoked at certain times. So let's take, for example, the goddess Kali. The goddess Kali is often seen as... Um, 
really fierce, right? Mirabai Starr, in her book, uh, Wild Mercy, Living the Fierce and Tender wi uh, wisdom of the women mystics talks about the legend of Kali and in the picture that you're seeing that that's depicting the legend where Kali has her her, uh, her foot on on Shiva but it's an amiable Shiva he's you know they're in concert with one another she he is the foundation on which she is standing and they have won the battle and and so uh, Mirabai says this about Kali. She says, Kali is the supreme mother, and in this legend, Shiva is the ground that supports her. She says her blue-black skin is the starless night sky, mysterious passageway from form to formlessness. Kali's sword cuts through illusion. The head she holds is the mask of ignorance, now free from the bondage of the ego. So all of this is depicted in these epic stories with these personified gods and goddesses, but they, they allow us to, to tap into something deeper, which is the archetypal kind of energy of that particular aspect of the divine. So there might be a time when a Kali-like energy is helpful to you, that kind of fierceness, that kind of cut away the dross and help me get to the place that I need to be, help me cut away whatever it is that stands in my way, my ignorance, my fear, the, the aspects of ego that might block our way to our good. She has that inner fierceness and that, that laser clarity and the kind of courage that sometimes we need to call upon. And it's that Kali-like fierceness that we ourselves will begin to embody as we call upon that kind of energy. It's the kind of thing that will allow us to slay any prejudice within us, to allow us to be freed from the kinds of things we're talking about, fear and ignorance and, and anger and, and all of it. So when we follow our innate knowing of what is right and true, we find that there is help all around us, inside us, in the allness of God, in the eachness of God, in our own embodiment, and with the, the family around us of humanity, right? Our friends, our family, even strangers. You see in the protests that happen now, the, the unition that happens for people that are working toward a single cause, that are speaking a single truth together. Things like Black Lives Matter. <laughs> And so it is that, that we are on this trajectory together and we can call in the kind of help where we stand with one another. Very similar to when J.D. and his friends stood with their friend Billy and he tells the story in this song. Let's take a moment to watch and listen. Hello and welcome to our living room. My name is Jan Garrett. I'm J.D. Martin, and today we're going to do a song for you called I Shall Not Be Moved. And we are so lucky to have the world's best band <laughs> and choir with and us choir. today. And choir. So there are going to be places for you guys to sing along, and please join us. It's, it's that kind of song. Let's just do it. Me and three friends, one summer at the Hiawassee, Georgia County Fair, could not believe our ears. We stopped and stared at a local politician saying, send them back to Africa, they don't belong here. What happened next seemed kind of like a joke at first. While the rest of us just turned to walk away Billy smeared his face and hands with Georgia clay Started singing, I shall not be moved I shall not be moved I watched the men who gathered round the politician tried to threaten Billy with their angry fists. 
But he just stood there His baseball cap looked like a halo God's own muddy angel Standing in our midst And a little courage Finally found my feet And I knew just what I had to do I knelt down in the dirt With all my heart and soul And started singing I shall not be Standing alone, defenseless I shall not be moved Yes, I am part of every color In this rainbow Wow, what a beautiful song. Thanks so much to Jan and JD for sharing their music with us. I believe that's one of their new ones, so it's just really beautiful. So um, there are these two elements that are, are working in tandem with each other always in our, in our society, in our um, spiritual journey. One is the mystic. The mystic is the one who turns within, right? The mystic is the one who is really attuned to uh, what, what's inside them. They're really attuned to the divinity of, of themselves and the divinity that's all around. And the prophet... The prophet is the one who acts, who gives voice to the awakening. The prophet is the one who helps us to wake up by taking action, kind of like an activist would today. And, and, and yet these terms are still very much alive and well for us to use. And so they, so f some of us might lean a little more toward mystic and others lean a little more toward prophet, yet they work together really nicely and we all have the capacity to be both. I think there may be a collective call now for us to build both skill sets. 
Contemplation is another word for prayer and meditation. It's the realm of the mystic. It's the place we go when we tap in and we get that guidance, right? We get insights or we might see or be given symbols or metaphors or words. We can have encouragement there, perhaps comfort, a sense of peace. There's many, many different things that can come for us when we take time out to go within, to sit in the quiet, to be in a meditative space. So yesterday I was sitting with my pad of paper and pen, which I often uh, work on my talks that way initially, and uh, I got this, this guidance really clearly, put the paper and pen away and go within. And so just where I was, I, I began to meditate. And uh, what brought me out of the meditation was this sound, a familiar sound that you may know too. Let's listen. It's making me look around. <laughs> Where's the crow or the raven, right? But that caw of the crow, it has such an insistent sound, doesn't it? It can have such an urgent sound. It's loud, it's distinct, and it's, it seems like it's saying, like, pay attention, listen to me, <laughs> you know? It's sort of like the sound of the prophet, how I imagine the classic prophet, the voice of the prophet that says, hey, folks, pay attention, now's the time to wake up. And if, if that crow was cawing something in English for all of us to hear, it might look something like, hey folks, this is the time, this is the time to jump in, there's a critical mass going on, and, and if we all moved together in the same direction, we can make the changes that we want to see in the world. We can help create a world that truly uh, would work for all. But, not, but don't, don't rest on your laurels, get in, jump in, step forward, listen to the insistency, the urgency that is in the voice of the prophet. You yourself may find yourself cawing at some point, becoming that insistent, urgent, loud voice that the crow brings forward for us. So we are collectively awakening, right? We are collectively awakening to violence against black and brown bodies, for one thing. We are collectively awakening to heartbreaking inequities in our world. And, and wanting to do something about it, I think a lot of us, and doing something about it. Some part of what we're doing now, many of us, and collectively in our community, is educating ourselves, learning more, learning more about our history, learning more about the everyday realities that some of us just really didn't fully understand or know, and still don't, but we're working on it. And so all, that's all we can do, right, is to say yes, to jump in, to step forward, to follow the caw of the crow, if you will. As I completed my meditation, I opened my eyes, and this is what I saw, these pink wildflowers, and behind it, a statue of Ganesh. And the pink wildflowers were so, um, they're so delicate, and, and they just sort of sway in the wind. And it reminded me that there is a softness, that this isn't all about sort of that fierceness that we talked about earlier, but it is also, there's a, there's a softness and a beauty, a blossoming that's happening inside of all of us, a blossoming of consciousness. And so it's happening inside us, it's happening to the people around us, it's happening as a collective. So there's a lot of beauty in humanity, you know, and that softness isn't necessarily weak. You know, even on those tall stems, I saw birds perching. I didn't get to capture them in the photo, but birds were perching, perching there. So there is a strength in that softness and that beauty that is there for us as a part of our divine walk. So as we go out in the world, as we go to the store and the park, <laughs> the places that we, we go right now in, in some of our limited movement, if we could only just look for and see the beauty in our brothers and sisters, see the beauty in humanity, soften our gaze and allow ourselves to also see the reflection of the divinity and the beauty that is in us, in, in the eyes of, our, of the people around us. And then finally, that statue of Ganesh that was behind the wildflowers is a similar um, kind of Hindu, he's a Hindu god, and similar kind of idea as Kali in terms of removing obstacles, but much gentler. 
Ganesh is playful energy. Ganesh takes his trunk and he just sort of swipes it to and fro to move the obstacles out of the path. And he often is depicted dancing in the shape of the om. So, so he has a real um, playful and inviting kind of energy. Sometimes we need the fierce energy of Kali to just sort of like, let's cut through this stuff and move forward, right? And other times it's that, that more playful energy um, and of removal. Now, Ganesha is also, or sometimes called Ganesha, is also about new beginnings. So in the Hindu tradition, Ganesha is always in invoked first is, is invoked at the beginning of something and, and the beginning of a major new beginning that's occurring in somebody's life or in all of our lives. And certainly that is the case here, <laughs> right? We're in the midst of both a pandemic and a civil rights movement at the same time. It feels pretty epic. And during this epic time, then, we can call upon or invoke a presence that can help us initiate into a new beginning. So whatever that is, if, it, if you don't relate necessarily to the personified gods and goddesses, it's still an aspect of the divine that we can call forth um, and, and allow that to be embodied as us as we move forward together. So as we, like Annie, take a step and say yes, even if we don't want to be here, and unlike Jonah, we do so with compassion. <laughs> We move forward with a compassion for ourselves and for each other, for all of us, for those who have been otherized and those who have been lifted up. And we see us all moving together to level that playing field, to call forth true divine justice. As we move forward together, we say no to the ill will in the world. We say no just as God has said no to that. And we say yes to including everyone, to treating everyone with equity and justice and love and joy and all the goodies we all want to enjoy in this beautiful world. And so together we can let the, the action flow from our contemplation. We can allow ourselves both to, to be a prophet and a mystic. We are both anyway. And so as we walk with both sides of ourselves fully, fully engaged, so we let those skill sets come up, we, we first sit in the contemplation, in the prayer and the meditation to receive the guidance, and then we act from there. It's that simple, really, but we make it so hard. We're like Jonah, <laughs> you know, pushing and pushing and pulling and digging in. And we see how that goes. It doesn't work so well. And so let's say yes, even if we feel a little no inside, because the greater response, the greater pull is a yes. And let's know that we don't do this alone, that we stand together with one another as we move forward. So I invite you to close out with me with this affirmation. Together, I follow through on spirit's guidance. I live in the flow of contemplative action. And so it is. Bless you on the journey. <laughs>